I'm live. Hi, Reader Patty. Continuing on, ever onward. Section three, how to discover what is the will of God. The divine action places before us at every moment things of infinite value and gives them to us according to the measure of our faith and love. If we understood how to see in each moment some manifestation of the will of God, we should find therein also all that our hearts could desire. In fact, there could be nothing more reasonable, more perfect, more divine than the will of God. Could any change of time, place, or circumstance alter or increase its infinite value? If you possess the secret of discovering it at every moment and in everything, then you possess all that is most precious and most worthy to be desired. What is it that you desire, you who aim at perfection? Give yourselves full scope. Your wishes, have, your wishes need have no measure, no limit. However much you may desire, I can show you how to attain it, even though it be infinite. There is never a moment in which I cannot enable you to obtain all that you can desire. The present is ever filled with infinite treasure. It contains more than you have capacity to hold. Faith is the measure. Believe and it will be done to you accordingly. Love is also the measure. The more the heart loves, the more it desires. And the more it desires, so much more will it receive. The will of God is at each moment before us like an immense, inexhaustible ocean that no human heart can fathom, but none can receive from it more than they have the capacity to contain. It is necessary to enlarge this capacity by faith, confidence, and love. The whole creation cannot fill the human heart, for it is greater than all that is not God. It is on a higher plane than the material creation, and for this reason, nothing material can satisfy it. The divine will is a deep abyss of which the present moment is the entrance. If you plunge into this abyss, you will find it infinitely more vast than your desires. Do not flatter anyone, nor worship your own illusions. They can neither give you anything nor receive anything from you. Receive your fullness from the will of God alone. It will not leave you empty. Adore it. Put it first, before all things. Tear all disguises from vain pretenses and forsake them all going straight to the soul reality. The reign of faith is death to the senses. It is their spoilation, their destruction. The senses worship creatures. Faith adores the divine will. Destroy the idols of the senses and they will rebel and lament. But faith must triumph because the will of God is indestructible. When the senses are terrified or famished, despoiled or crushed, then it is that faith is nourished, enriched, and enlivened. Faith laughs at these calamities as a governor of an impregnable fortress laughs at the useless attacks of an impotent foe. When a soul recognizes the will of God and shows a readiness to submit to it entirely, then God gives himself to such a soul and renders it most powerful succor under all circumstances. Thus, it experiences a great happiness in this coming of God and enjoys it the more the more it has learned to abandon itself at every, morning, at every moment to his adorable will. Section 4, The Revelations of God God reveals himself to us in as mysterious a manner in the most ordinary circumstances and as truly and adorably as in great events of history or of Holy Scripture. The written word of God is full of mystery and no less so God's word fulfilled in the events of the world. The and of both, it can be said, the letter God is the center of faith. 
all that emanates from this center is hidden in the deepest mystery. This word and these events are, so to say, but feeble rays from a sun obscured by clouds. It is vain to expect to see with our mortal eyes the rays of this sun. Even the eyes of our soul are blind to God and his works. Darkness takes the place of light, ignorance of knowledge, and one neither sees nor understands. The sacred scripture is the mysterious utterance of a God yet more mysterious, and the events of the world are the obscure language of this same hidden and unknown God. They are mere drops from an ocean of midnight darkness and partake of the nature of their source. The fall of the angels and of Adam, the impiety and idolatry of men before and after the deluge, up to the time of the patriarchs who knew and related to their children the history of creation, and of the still recent preservation from the universal deluge, these are indeed very obscure words of scripture. That at the coming of the Messiah, only a handful of men should be preserved from idolatry in the general rule, in the general ruin and overthrow of faith throughout the world. That impiety should always prove dominant, always powerful, and the small numbers of the upholders of truth should be ever persecuted and maltreated seems incredible. Consider the treatment of Jesus Christ. Think of the plagues of the apocalypse, yet these are words of God. They are what God has revealed. God has dictated them. And the effect of these terrible mysteries, which will continue till the end of time, is still the living word, teaching us God's wisdom, power, and goodness. All the events which form the world's history show forth these divine attributes. All teach the same adorable word. We cannot doubt it, although we do not see. What is meant by the existence of Turks, heretics, and enemies of the church? Surely they all proclaim loudly the divine perfections. Pharaoh and the impious who follow their example are allowed to exist only for that purpose, but assuredly, unless beheld with the eye of faith, it would all have the exactly contrary appearance. To behold divine mysteries, it is necessary to shut the eyes to what is external and to cease to reason. You speak, Lord, to the generality of human by great public events. Every resolution is as a wave from the sea of your providence, raising storms and tempests in the minds of those who question your mysterious action. You speak also to each individual soul by the circumstances in occurring at every moment of life. Instead, however, of hearing your voice in these events and receiving with awe what is obscure and mysterious in these, your words, humans see in there only the outward aspect or chance or the caprice of others and censure everything. Humans would like to add or diminish or reform and to allow themselves absolute liberty to commit any excess, the least of which would be a criminal and unheard of outrage. They respect the Holy Scriptures, however, and will not permit the addition of ingle, even a single comma. It is the word of God, say they, and is altogether holy and true. If we cannot understand it, it is all the more wonderful, and we must give glory to God and render justice to the depths of God's wisdom. All this is perfectly true, but when you read God's word from moment to moment, not written with ink on paper, but on your soul, with suffering, and the daily actions that you have to perform, does it not merit some attention on your part? How is it that you cannot see the will of God in all this? Instead, you find fault with everything that happens. Nothing pleases you. Do you not see that you are gauging everything by the senses and by reason, not by faith, the only true standard? And that when you read the word of God and the sacred scriptures with the eye of faith, 
you do wrong to make use only of your reason in reading the word in God's marvelous operations. Section 5. The Action of Jesus Christ in the Souls of Men The divine action continues to write in the hearts of men the work begun by the Holy Scriptures, but the characters made use of in this writing will not be visible until the Day of Judgment. Jesus Christ yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 8, 8, says the Apostle. From the beginning of the world, he was, as God, the first cause of the existence of souls. He has participated as man from the first instant of his incarnation, in this prerogative of his divinity. During the whole course of our life, God acts within our souls. The time that will elapse till the end of the world is but as a day, and this day abounds with God's action. Jesus Christ has lived and lives still. Jesus began from God's self and will continue in God's saints a life that will never end. O life of Jesus, comprehending and extending beyond all the centuries of time, life affecting new operations of grace at every moment. If no one is capable of understanding all that could be written of the actual life of Jesus, all that Jesus did and said while Jesus was on earth, if the gospel merely outlines a few of its features, how many gospels would have to be written to record the history of all the moments of this mystical life of Jesus Christ in which miracles are multiplied to infinity and eternity? If the beginning of Jesus' natural life is so hidden, yet so fruitful, what can be said of the divine action of that life of which every age of the world is the history. The Holy Spirit has pointed out in infallible and incontestable characters some moments in that ocean of time in the sacred scriptures. In them we see by what secret and mysterious ways God has brought Jesus before the world. Amidst the confusion of the races of humans can be distinguished the origin, race, and genealogy of this, the firstborn. The whole of the Old Testament is but an outline of the profound mystery of this divine work. It contains only what is necessary to relate concerning the advent of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has kept all the rest hidden among the treasures of God's wisdom. From this ocean of the divine activity, God allows only a tiny stream to escape. And this stream, having gained its way to Jesus, is lost in the apostles and has been engulfed in the apocalypse. So that the history of this divine activity, consisting of the life of Jesus and the souls of the just to the end of time, can only be divined by faith. As the truth of God has been made known by word of mouth, so God's charity is manifested by action. The Holy Spirit continues to carry on the work of our Savior. While helping the church to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, he writes his own gospel in the hearts of the just. All the actions of the just every moment of their lives are the gospel of the Holy Spirit. The souls of the saints are the paper, the sufferings and actions the ink. The Holy Spirit, with the pen of God's power, writes a living gospel, but a gospel that cannot be read until it has left the press of this life and has been published on the day of eternity. O oh, great history, grand book written by the Holy Spirit in this present time. It is still in the press. There is never a day when the type is not arranged, when the ink is not applied, or the pages are not primed. We are still in the dark night of faith. The paper is blacker than the ink, and there is great confusion in the type. It is written in characters of another world, and there is no understanding it except in heaven. If we could see the life of God and behold all creatures, not as they are in themselves, but as they exist in their first cause, 
And if again, we could see the life of God in all God's creatures and could understand how the divine action animates them and impels them all to press forward by different ways to the same goal, we should realize that all has a meaning, a measure, a connection in this divine work. But how can we read the book, the characters of which are foreign to us? The letters innumerable, the type reversed, and the pages blotted with ink. If the transposition of 25 letters is incomprehensible as sufficing for the composition of a well-nigh infinite number of different volumes, each admirable of its kind, who can explain the works of God in the universe? Who can read and understand the meaning of so vast a book in which there is no letter but has its particular character, and it closes its apparent insignificance, the most profound mysteries. Mysteries can neither be seen nor felt. They are objects of faith. Faith judges of their virtue and truth only by their origin, for they are so obscure in themselves that all that they show only serves to hide them and to blind those who judge only by reason. Teach me, divine spirit, to read in this book of life. I desire to become your dis disciple and like a little child to believe what I cannot understand and cannot see. Sufficient for me that it is my master who speaks. God says that. God pronounces this. God arranges the letters in such a fashion. God makes God's self heard in such a manner and that is enough. I decide that all is exactly as God says. I do not see the reason, but God is the infallible truth. Therefore, all that God says, all that God does is true. God groups God's letters to form a word and different letters again to form another word. There may be three only or six, then no more are necessary and fewer would destroy the sense. He who reads the thoughts of men is the only one who can bring these letters together and write the words. All has meaning. All has perfect sense. This line ends here because God makes it do so. Not a comma is missing and there is no unnecessary full stop. At present I believe, but in the glory to come, when so many mysteries will be revealed, I shall see plainly what I now so little understand. Then what appears to me at present so intricate, so perplexing, so foolish, so inconsistent, so imaginary, will all be entrancing and will delight me eternally by the beauty, order, knowledge, wisdom, and the incomprehensible wonders it will all display. Thanks for joining me today in our journey to abandonment to divine providence.